Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back here at the AM Force U stage at our last and unfortunately final day at Form Next 2021. After our interesting morning talk, we will kick off the day with a very interesting panel covering the topic of ceramics in additive manufacturing. The panel will discuss current status, the potential in regards of applications for the industry, and of course, future trends. We have an excellent lineup, so let me quickly introduce you our panelists. So, first of all, we have Dr. Steffen Walter, head of production, uh, no, head of processes and product development from Alumina Systems GmbH. Then we have Richard Guignon over there, yeah. Um, who's CEO of 3 d Sinto. Then we have Dr. Tassilo Moritz, Head of Department of Processes and Components at Fraunhofer Institute for Ceramic Technology and Systems. A very long title, but I hope I put <laughs> it correctly. Um, then we had Dr. Holger Friedrich, Group Leader Ceramics at Fraunhofer. Perfect, good to have you here. Then we have Iris Heibel, Sales Manager, Glow Prat Grow platform from Bosch Advanced Ceramics. And last but not least, we have Johannes Homer. There's nothing more, Johannes, and I think you need to introduce later on yourself. Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, our moderator for the session today is Ms. Karen Schara, Editor-in-Chief from the Göller Verlag. Karen, I will head over to you. Thanks Enjoy a lot. the session. So uh, possibly we get uh, our uh, backup presentation. Excellent. So. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I'm representing uh, Ceramic Applications, that's one of our magazines, but Ceramic Applications is not only a magazine uh, which is uh, published in print and online, it's also a networking platform uh, where about 80 companies uh, are together, uh, 35 from Germany, the most others from Europe, but we have also uh, members from uh, India, uh, Japan, and the United States all have uh, expertise in uh, technical ceramics. And in the last years in the ceramic <coughs> industry, additive uh, manufacturing uh, became more and more important. And uh, now uh, my friends here uh, that are let's say from our group of 80 companies, maybe the most important uh, expert in this field, but uh, I uh, want to give a brief introduction uh, to you, uh, technical ceramics, because uh, ceramics sometimes is received as, oh, ceramics is my cup in the morning or my uh, tiles or my bathroom. Uh, as most technical ceramic components are in some way uh, hidden champions. So there are uh, components uh, which uh, are uh, an element of a, a, a very complex system and I uh, put here together all the potential user industries and not only uh, potential, also really user industries that's from automotive, aviation, space travel, energy technology, uh, wherever, where, and corrosion prediction is uh, uh, important. Medical technology, electronics, environment, heat trend, treatment. So uh, I don't want to read all details, and especially now uh, where uh, climate change is, a, uh, change is an issue, all this uh, insulation, or uh, for water technology, environmental technology, ceramics can offer a lot. Uh, uh, it's uh, more a general uh, survey. Uh, ceramics is a powder technology. We use either oxide, silicate-based, or nitrate, or carbon-based materials, even uh, reinforced materials uh, uh, in uh, part of the uh, material portfolio. I put in uh, final products uh, are mainly very dense products. Uh, densification has to be done by uh, heat treatment, so we have firing processes dependent on the material, let's say from 1300 uh, degree to 1,800 uh, degree, uh, 
that's why uh, ceramic products are compared to polymer or metal-based products uh, pretty often the most expensive ones. But on the other hand, uh, there is a need uh, for a technical solution when you uh, have uh, to uh, reach either high heat resistance or uh, electrical uh, or thermal insulation, uh, extreme uh, corrosion resistance. So uh, when, let's say, harsh working environment is the case, you may need uh, ceramic components. And uh, of course, uh, without additive manufacturing for decades, ceramics has been uh, manufactured either in uh, shaping technologies like casting, like pressing, extrusion. And uh, in the last, let's say, 15 years, initially it was uh, mainly research, pretty much uh, additive manufacturing systems uh, were developed and uh, I hand over now to uh, Tassilu Moritz, who supported me to give a short overview and uh, prepared this little chart. And I think it's for you now to explain a little bit which type of uh, additive manufacturing systems ceram ceramists uh, prefer to use. Yes, in the field of additive manufacturing of ceramics, we have a huge bundle of different technologies which we might use. <coughs> and the um, processes I mentioned here are not complete, huh? especially uh, direct ink writing, for instance, is missing. But we can divide roughly additive manufacturing of ceramics either in direct and indirect methods, but more practical from our point of view is to divide into powder-based methods and suspension or feedstock-based methods because this describes how the product uh, will be after the process, either porous or dense. <coughs> but um, ceramic <coughs> additive manufacturing remains powder technology. And this is one thing I have really to emphasize. Because when your process is ready, you will not get a ceramic part from the building platform. You will attain a green part in all these additive manufacturing methods. <coughs> and now you have to debind this part and you have to synthesize the part. After the shaping process, it has a green or it has green dimensions, and now during the heat treatment, it will shrink. And so you have to take into consideration this shrinkage already during your building process, and you have to work with an oversizing factor. This is very important for uh, additive manufacturing of ceramics. OK, uh, we promised uh, to show uh, some components. Uh, I said uh, ceramic is mostly uh, price-wise the most luxury <coughs> solution. And that's why I asked my partners uh, to present uh, nice applications. And uh, to be impressive, we thought first we start with space. And I hand over to Richard uh, uh, from 3D uh, Saram Sinto. They are uh, um, equipment manufacturers, printing, and of course they have the responsibility for uh, the uh, process chain as well. And I kindly ask you to give <coughs> us some details on this application you developed with your partner. Thank you, Karin. So in the whole application you mentioned, there is one which is quite important, that's the space application, you know? Ceramic is already used in the space, in a conventional space, I would say, but 3D printing is quite interesting for different reasons. Why 3D printing in space? Because if you save one kilo of components, you save 
roughly 200,000 euros. So you can understand that there is a big interest to have design, uh, lightweight design. The second interest, I will take the example of the antenna, which is on the left or right, but the one that you start with a sketch and you end up with a, a final product. Um, they use ceramic uh, for the dielectric properties. Very unique. It's a zirconia, and um, ceramic in the space can stand the very complicated and hard condition, you know? You have ionization during the launch, it's very hard because you have vibration, and you have a uh, heat and a uh, cold and a uh, cycle and so on. So there are not so many materials that can stand in the space. Ceramic can. And on this example, we add some properties, electromagnetic properties, dielectric, and they are able with the shape that, which is described on the sketch to um, modulate the dielectric properties according to the need of the customers. Okay, that's the good point. So flexibility of the 3D and the properties of the ceramic that they combine. And another point which is quite important, why it's very, uh, I would not say common, but why now we can find more and more ceramic in the space and more and more 3D printing in the space, it's because 3D printing is a flexible, low, sh uh, short development time between the prototype and the part sent in the space, it was 18 months. From the concept to the final part, 18 months. You cannot do that with a traditional technology. <laughs> On the other side, it's another example which is thruster. What is a thruster? The new space, you have mini satellite at 400 kilometers. If you launch satellite at 400 kilometers, very soon they will collapse in the atmosphere. So you need engines. We call it thruster. And most of the shape of this thruster are made with another ceramic. And this time, we are not looking for the dielectric <coughs> properties, but the thermal properties, insulation. They should stand heat in order that the mini satellite could be moved to another place, or simply they will not collapse into the atmosphere. So space, you see, it's an early adopter for 3D printing ceramic for different applications. I could speak about mirrors, mirrors and other stuff that we, uh, 3D Ceram, has developed with customers. Thank you so much, Lisa. And uh, brings us to back up <laughs> the uh, given example. Uh, it's a project from Fraunhofer and Tassilo. I think you will give a short explanation to this aerospike. Yes, we have an application uh, pointing into the same direction, <coughs> as you mentioned, Richard. Um, we uh, developed together with the Technical University of Dresden an uh, aerospike engine for a very low thrust glass. Because for uh, stabilizing a mini satellite in the orbit or to let him return to Earth, we only need some Newton uh, of, of um, uh, power and uh, the challenge for making those components is to uh, have very tight tolerances and um, this is a very small engine which we made here by wet photopolymerization basing on alumina and um, the surface and the uh, tolerances we are uh, really good and convincing for such an application here. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I hand over to Johannes. Uh, we are already uh, in a state where we uh, can do multi-material uh, printing, and that's why I ask Johannes to give us an example, and uh, uh, <coughs> you see it's copper and ceramics, and more details you will learn from Johannes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So, um, we, with what we see here is a multi-material component. So basically, as we already heard, one of the advantages of, of uh, ceramics is that it's non-conductive, so uh, you need an, sometimes an isolating effect. Uh, and here what we see is that copper, as again, as a, as a conductive material, can be used, but you need an isolator. And we are combining here 
uh, ceramics and metals in 3D printing. Um, this is already well known from, from LTTC, so low, low temperature co-fired ceramics. Uh, but what we can do now is really to bring this into, a, uh, into 3D printing. Uh, we have systems developed to make, to make that happen. And um, there are basically a lot of uh, applications for that, especially, of course, anywhere where you need uh, conductive materials. But of course, you can also combine ceramics with ceramics, um, but also ceramics with metals. And um, yeah, I think from, from, from this type of thing, this is really the next step of, of additive manufacturing, of combining two materials. And you can also do functionally graded materials. There are a lot of potential with this multi-material uh, in, in, in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. OK, <coughs> we go back to Richard. He uh, gave us an example. It, it's good to have it, but I think nobody want to be the one who needs it, but it give us some background on uh, the activity in biomedical, because uh, your company had, uh, in very early days, uh, started with this field. Yeah. Just before, I was talking about space application, which is quite new. Uh, but keep in mind that 3D printing ceramic is not a, a new thing. You know, we, we already printed um, implants, skull implant in 2005, or um, bone substitutes for uh, spinal cages uh, <coughs> since 2007. So why do we use ceramic in this case? 3D printing is, I would say, just there to bring several functions to the product. This, you all know about that. So if I take the example of the skull implant, you have a customized implant. Great. So 3D printing is really a good answer. But you can have on the outside porosity to allow the bone to grow into it, to fix the implant. And you can decide to have some bigger holes to fix the implant, to let the, the copper to acquire the implant and to fix it. Um, so, and, but the real thing behind why it's very popular and it's developing more and more could be skull implant or cages and so on, or it could be also dental application, or it could be uh, um, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, other implants, it's because it, it saves time to the surgeon. That's really the point. So it means in the same period of time, you can do more case than before. So you can make a little bit more money because at the end of the game, if you print, it's sooner or later someone has to make a little bit more money than before. Otherwise, there is no future for the 3D printing. Thank you. <coughs> OK, now I have. Uh, for, uh, from Iris, uh, a very nice uh, selection of parts. Uh, so 3D uh, printed ceramics parts can be up to one, one meter or larger, but that's the opposite side. They can be very small. And uh, it's your turn, Iris, to give some explanation to this. It looks a little bit like jewelry, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very much. technical yeah, product. <laughs> so thank you for, the, for your introduction. So um, as Bosch Advanced Ceramics, we are producing with uh, uh, sterile little coffee, um, oxide ceramics, um, very complex <laughs> shapes. These are some explanation, some, some, some parts which we produce to show how complex we could produce the ceramics very tiny uh, details, also very tiny channels into the ceramic, which is not possible to do with uh, traditional ceramic production processes. And, um, and we are focusing on um, dense materials. So these parts are um, having the best properties out of this process. And um, we are focusing on various markets like electronics, like um, medical application, for medical devices. Um, the um, trend in the technical ceramic is going to um, tinier parts, especially for the medical application, um, where you need high precision also, <coughs> and a, a nice surface, good uh, isolation behavior of the ceramics, but also a hard material which could be used in, um, as a scissor, for example. And so um, this is, these are 
some ideas which we would like to um, show to you to give you some some possibilities to maybe change your design for your products, which is important, especially if we look to an engineering partners. So you can do much more than you have been able to do at, uh, until now. So this is what I would like to present to you. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so it's for Holger. Thank you very much. Yes, well, I've you can see two different kinds of materials here, which I have chosen. The white material, these are, se these are sensor heads that we use for and produce in our lab for investigating thermal processes and furnaces. And the big advantage of 3D printing here is that we have a high flexibility on which functionalities we include in these sensor heads. And they are very delicate, they are very robust, they are made from alumina and have a very good su surface quality, and alumina is very corrosive resistant, so it's ideal for investigating furnaces and to optimize them with respect to energy efficiency and so on. And you can see in the top picture on the right uh, a further principle of 3D printing of ceramics from my point of view. It's the combination of different materials. So you can see here the sensor head made from alumina, and then on the right side, you can see a tube which is made from a ceramic matrix composite, which is very thermal shock resistant. And those are combined by, by a glass ceramic. So you take the best out of all for building up the whole component. So there are a lot of advantages using and doing this in 3D printing. And on the left side, you can see, can see some kind of tower. So this has been produced completely differently. It's a binder jetting process. And whereas we have the sintering process for the alumina, for the binder jetting process, we don't have to sinter. This is a silicon infiltrated silicon carbide material. It's baskets which we use for producing our ceramic fibers that we produce in-house for heat treatment. And you can see the, the very open structure. It's again very lightweight and it's a rather large components, and it's a completely different material, and by the silicon, inf silicon carbide product, you can actually have a complete near net shape process. You print a powder bed material, a green material, which has the final dimension, and that is infiltrated by a molten metal, in this case silicon, which fills out all the pores and gives a very stable material. And again, it's very flexible. You can produce larger parts. And here's another principle which I wanted to show. You can see that the, the baskets are made up of several components. So we could have printed one of these baskets in a single print, but then it would have been only one basket per print. By taking it into several parts, we could print up to 12, which increases efficiency a lot, and we can uh, work much more efficiently here. So it's different principles which you have to consider when using 3D printing for ceramics. One point is also the thermal processes, which have already been mentioned a lot. It's very important to understand the processes of debinding, sintering, to actually have the final product in the first process run, and that you don't need 10 trials to get the final dimensions. And that's why everyone is putting a lot of effort into these optimization processes. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. Yeah, we have now here a nice example uh, Stefan will uh, present and not only <coughs> you see the picture, uh, we have uh, one of the smaller rings here uh, to show it from stage and uh, when we finish you can come and uh, look more closely. And I think you got already some keywords uh, uh, precision of the process. Uh, ceramic production is a very long process chain and uh, reliability, precision are very challenging, but you know it better. <laughs> it's <laughs> your daily job. Okay, thank you. Um, so one, uh, well, one other important part in the industry right now is to have a look on the, for this, in the semiconductor field. So the semiconductor industry is uh, increasing a lot and as you know, uh, the, the, the time uh, between uh, chip generation from one to one to one is, uh, is decreasing, so it's getting shorter. So the development time is uh, decreasing. 
And uh, we were able to develop uh, in the last two, two and a half years um, uh, a new technology with this uh, sort of rings here. So this ring is, um, <coughs> uh, um, is uh, used for atomic uh, layer deposition. Um, I brought here an exponent with me. So this is the size of a ring with a 380 in diameter. So this is the smaller one of this you can see here. And the other is, uh, the bigger size you see is around 500. So 500 in diameter, all made out of uh, ceramic and 3D printed in our uh, big machine. So just to give you a brief overview what such a ring is doing. So imagine that uh, such a ring they have here Inside, they have uh, certain nozzles, they have a certain design, which is uh, <coughs> uh, very important for, for, for the precipitation of the uh, reactants. And what uh, this ring is uh, clicked into, um, into a plate, where also the connections of the gases are inside. And in between the ring and uh, where, and the wafer, which is located underneath, there is a plasma in between. So during the precipitation process, you have, um, <coughs> you spray in certain gases and you precipitate the reactants onto the wafer. And what you do right now is you can do with it, with this technology is that you're able to do the precipitation process and the etching pr process in one step. So this is completely new. And this also shortens the time for a uh, new generation of uh, semiconductor process and ICs. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's again from uh, Tassilo, uh, an example to so hand over. <coughs> To the, for the six film heaters to you again. Yes, for many applications, <coughs> it might not be interesting to have an active heating, but also an active cooling. Because an active cooling can save a lot of time during different processes. And in our special field here, we produced during the pandemic a PCR module. And uh, this is a biochemical reactor for uh, um, uh, testing. And it needs an active heating for initiating a uh, biological reaction. And it needs an active cooling for interrupting this uh, uh, biological reaction at a certain uh, time. And, uh, the wet phot uh, photopolymerization allows us for making inner hollow channels in a ceramic part. On the um, left-hand side, you can see this inner channel structure. And then we print it by screen printing um, a conductive layer onto the part for attaining an active heating. And so we could combine active cooling is active heating for this biological or biochemical reaction which we want to influence here. Thanks a lot. Okay, it is, uh, that was, let's say, part one. Uh, I asked uh, uh, my colleagues here to present some interesting examples to show you that ceramics is not only the coffee cup in the morning, that uh, ceramics can be really a solution provider. And so uh, as a key worker, I used your uh, ceram factoring. Uh, and we have here three columns. Uh, I want to discuss in the second part. AM in the research will never stop from various aspects. Uh, but meanwhile, and we are very proud that we have additive manufacturing developed as an additional shaping technology to manufacture uh, uh, ceramic components. And what's also a good news that AM helps 
to get newcomers in our community because, uh, yeah, as a ceramist and uh, as I'm a ceramic engineer, that's why I'm allowed to say it, we are somehow a little bit a close group sometimes. We know each other a long time, and, uh, but we, we want to have fresh ideas, and that's why uh, when I follow uh, the market of the last 10 years, uh, a very good news is that we can attract people who are used to other materials and uh, I, uh, there will not be a, a long discussion but we have an example provided by Richard and maybe you give some comments on this <laughs> really new yeah. equipment and uh, the idea behind because it's not uh, the sort to have it for series production it's yeah. Uh, yeah maybe for education and for new partners yeah la like uh, Tassimo presented there are several um, process in uh, 3d printing as you know almost the same as for metal or polymer or plastic um, and well, the most effective right now, I mean, to get a real dense and good product is SLA, stereolithography, with laser or DLP, whatever. There are some pros and cons on both sides. <coughs> but actually, we should give the freedom to uh, uh, research people or to newcomers to choose the technology they want to develop or to understand which one is the best. So we have developed at 3D Serum a, a new machine whose name is multi-additive technology which means that we have a frame. You know, it's a small machine which can print on 20, 20, and 20 centimeters. Um, and we can adapt several heads on it. It could be a filament printer. It could be a robot casting printer. We can also have a CNC head on top of it. And just to say, well, try, develop, and see how to develop the, the, the application as well. Because we have so many times people coming and asking, OK, what can I do with? And I mean, as an equipment supplier or process supplier, it's not my duty to say, OK, the market is there, the market is there, but here are the tools for you to develop the market. And the example of PCR is, is quite good, PCR, uh, because there was a one technology, and they found the market. Uh, now, with this tool, it's a flexible tool to, find, to adapt the right technology, the right material to the right market. So that's what we want to do and to go with our customers in order to uh, develop the 3D printing in ceramic. Thank you. I go back now because uh, more important are the other two columns. Uh, maybe uh, I am in research. I kindly ask Tassili to come in again uh, for a certain reason. Of course, he is here as representative of Fraunhofer. But uh, for many years, you were very, very active in the German Ceramic Society, uh, taking care of uh, the expert group uh, Additive Manufacturing. It was called initially seen Additive Manufacturing, where a lot of institutes work together, so I have a good overview of what was going on in research. And uh, the research uh, will never stop because uh, on the one hand, uh, you showed the most important techniques. There are others still in process to be developed, to be adapted. Uh, uh, we had already an example for hybrid solutions in components, and we are pretty sure we will have uh, new materials in future. And so I kindly uh, uh, give some insight to the last 10 years, because this expert group is now renamed to use a group of additive manufacturing, which leads us to ceramic production later on. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, this um, additive um, manufacturing group, which is called user group additive ceramic manufacturing in the German Ceramic Society, um, does not only bundles the competences of research institutes. We also have um, 11 uh, industrial partners. Uh, all of them are users of additive manufacturing technologies. And we want to bring all these technologies onto a productive level. Yeah? And we, we 
know is that we have a lot to do in this field, especially in, in research and in pushing these technologies onto a uh, productive level. At first, we have uh, to um, find a way to attain properties which are comparable with conventionally shaped components. We have to um, in, increase the productivity. We have to uh, uh, be sure that the properties of an additively manufactured parts are the same in comparison to a conventionally shaped part. And um, furthermore, we want to combine such additive manufacturing technologies with conventional technologies. We want to combine different materials. For um, getting to a more uh, productive um, solution, we also will have to implement non-destructive testing as inline measuring methods into the uh, processes for being able in future to build really intelligent machines which learn when something goes wrong in the process, which can stop the process and which may actively repair a part or which can adjust their process parameters to getting again into um, a productive process. Thank you. All these are the, the tasks we will uh, try to solve within such a user group. Thank you. Yeah, but now uh, I uh, want to go to the column in the middle. I am in, in production and I hand over uh, to Johannes again. Uh, it was for sure a long way to go from research. Next was prototyping technology, but we are now really proud that we can say uh, it's a production uh, technology. Uh, in fact, at the moment nearby, near Düsseldorf, a production plant is erected to be opened uh, in January. So it's reality and I got this nice slide from uh, Johannes who uh, will expand a little bit on uh, this project with your partner Steinbach from Germany. And I think we have some uh, nice figures here because when it's production, it's uh, reliability, reproducibility, and uh, yeah, get us a little bit your experience. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, is a, you are completely right. I think there is, uh, of course, there's the need of, of doing uh, also small series and prototyping, but uh, the big challenge is then to go into, into serial production. And I think uh, here we have, we've come a long way and it was a tough way, but uh, we are now really in serial production of, of additive manufacturing of ceramics. And, uh, and there, you know, we have a little bit tougher requirements. And here with our partner Steinbach, uh, or not we, but uh, actually they uh, producing already in, in serial uh, some um, medical parts. These are some, some tubes. So these are 12,000 parts per year, uh, which is needed. They're produced actually in a um, couple of, of, of weeks uh, to, to do them. And the, the requirements are really tough. So about uh, plus, plus 20 microns on the outer geometry, uh, what has to be achieved. And this part can only be produced by additive manufacturing, because I don't know if you can see it, but it makes a small bend. Uh, this little tube, and, and this is the, the big aim here. And uh, we have here wall thickness as well of very, very small. So 0.2 millimeters is the wall thickness here. And um, if you're talking about uh, uh, 12,000 parts per year, uh, it's also not, or more or less not possible to, to, to post machine them or to, to finish them. Um, so they, they have to be as printed and here we're achieving a very 
uh, good surface roughness, so an RA value of well below one micro, so 0.4 uh, micrometer. And uh, I think here you, have, you see an example that additive manufacturing is not just about prototyping, but also uh, already as a serial production technology. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I uh, only uh, uh, don't, do not want only uh, to show results, as we have experts who work on the technology chain. Maybe we go back to uh, Stefan with this ring you have seen. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, you have to ensure high precision uh, and uh, being uh, in a status which is ceramic production, it's no more uh, a first prototype. You have to calculate uh, your production costs. And uh, I know that you have different concepts to produce this ring. In theory, it's possible to print it because you have a large machine. But you told me yesterday uh, there are other aspects to, to think about uh, process and uh, efficiency of process in-house. Possibly you give some insights on this as well. Yes, I can. So um, <clears throat> when, you, when you think about to produce such a ring in this size, which is really one of the biggest actually in the world, what we have, then you have to, to think about a, a, a sort of strategy you need and, uh, and a process chain to really get out high quality at the end to, to, fin to finalize a, a ring like this. So uh, at the beginning, sure, there's the thinking, well, you can print this ring in one piece. This is possible. But then you have to think about, well, how do I get a ring, uh, such a ring in that size out of the, or out of, from the platform and then think about the debinding process, which is a second step, and then the final step is the sintering step, and each time you're sweating, are, is, the, is the ring coming out properly after that uh, process step? And so that we, we decided <coughs> to work uh, or to produce such a ring in a form of uh, modular concept. So what that means that we divided the rings in several pieces, and we print this parts on the machine and uh, so you have you gain two other aspects so the first aspect is that you have um, you bring you, you do not only print one ring on the platform with this uh, modular concept you can print four five or six ring in one print so you increase the production and the second is um, Afterwards, you have to, to think about, well, is this ring size the only ring size uh, you, you will have? Right now, we are talking about 380 micrometers or 500. But what happens if, if, uh, if our client is coming and says, OK, right now, I need a ring of 700 or 1 meter. So then you are able to do this, because you, with this sort of modular concept, you are able to produce that sizes. So, and, and if you have such uh, parts, um, these will be glazed afterwards, so to the complete ring. And uh, the insert or how it is done, this is really know-how of our uh, company. Yeah, and uh, uh, I also know that uh, a special know-how of your company is uh, uh, joining technologies yeah. that's... Uh, uh, <coughs> was a good aspect to find this more uh, efficient, cost-wise, more efficient uh, solution and also when it comes to reliability. Yeah, I have uh, additive manufacturing and uh, uh, injection molding. Uh, that's another nice story. Uh, uh, in uh, ceramic technology, we have uh, I think uh, for more than 20 years injection molding and uh, I'm more an observer of the uh, community. Uh, my impression is that with this advances in additive manufacturing, even this uh, injection molding technology got the push, yeah, because they got competition, yeah. And uh, I think it's again you who had 
projects uh, uh, where we, uh, it was started with additive manufacturing and for some reasons uh, later transferred to uh, injection molding. We maybe one want to give a comment on this. Um, yes, additive manufacturing uh, helps us a lot in uh, ceramic injection molding because we now have the opportunity to do a so-called free freeform injection molding technique. We can build tool inserts uh, by additive manufacturing. We can make uh, polymeric tool inserts and now we are able to make injection molding of only single parts. This would never be possible so far because we always had to build an expensive tool for injection molding and the tool cannot be changed so easy uh, and such a tool is for uh, several uh, tens of thousands of pieces but with such polymeric additively manufactured inserts we can now make only one part and so we can also make prototypes by injection molding and there's another point we can make series parts by ceramic injection molding and then we can individualize such components by combining the ceramic injection molding with additive manufacturing yeah, so it's again an example uh, that additive manufacturing helped a lot to inspire ceramists to conquer new fields. And uh, that's always uh, 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 good news for me. I have one point, uh, additive manufacturing can even be used in ceramic production for, for preforms. Uh, uh, I refer a little bit to your uh, list uh, project. Uh, it's maybe very specific, but maybe you can give one or two comments on, on this. Yeah, I think as uh, Tasla already pointed out at the very beginning, there are different types of, of technologies available. And I think there is no superior technology which says, okay, this can uh, solve all issues with, with all additive manufacturing things. So basically there are for each application, for each requirement, you have a, a special purpose as you have drilling and machining and, and, and turning. That's the same in, in additive manufacturing. You have different uh, technologies and we have also one technology where you can make preforms and which is more near net shape, but has other advantages compared to the current, uh, to the current available technologies. Mm. Yeah, so I think we have maybe the last uh, five uh, minutes and I put in the key word uh, visions. Yeah, so uh, at the moment we are really in this interesting phase uh, to confirm uh, uh, that's uh, uh, in series uh, production. And uh, maybe I come back to Richard again because as an equipment supplier and the same applies for you, Johannes, of course you are equipment machine suppliers, but uh, you are partners for those who want to enter uh, either the ceramic scene or uh, what's more often when it's uh, uh, ceramic production, they want to have this additional shaping technology and uh, uh, your uh, advice starts to help them to prepare paste or whatever they need uh, to uh, give some advices for the post uh, processing. So, uh, what's from your point of view, Richard, the situation and what do you expect in the next uh, two, three years uh, for? Uh, uh, the development uh, for uh, series production because you have some additional steps already at hand, yeah. Well, from an uh, equipment supplier or process provider point of view, but it would be good to ask for a uh, part supplier because normally we follow what the market is asking. Uh, we do see that we need uh, automatization of the process. To print automatically, we do it for years. Although our customers are doing it for years, even serial production with big surface and so on. But what is important is to be able to produce, uh, to manufacture automatically parts 
having nobody to remove the parts, having nobody to clean or the parts from uh, slurry, powder, or whatsoever, having nobody to put the parts into the kiln. Because if you look at the ceramic industry, it's highly automated in order to cut down the price. So if you look at 3D printing, and if you look at it for years ago, you have to take the parts, you have to clean the parts, you have to put them in the kiln, to remove the kiln. No way for, for that. So I think we really have to think in order to go into the direction of automatization. Um, and it depends on the technology which is suitable for the application. Regarding slurries, you know, uh, slurries are mat raw material, I would say, because it's really depending on the technology that we are addressing. Uh, the raw material is depending on the application. So we, we see different, uh, it's really depending from uh, countries to countries. You don't have the same needs in the US or in Asia or in Europe because it depends where the market is very strong. So let's see. So I think it would be good to ask a technical ceramic supplier to ask his uh, point of view. And I mean, as a process provider, we will follow them. So mm. that uh, will be my point. So you ask me to oh, for Steph no. <laughs> yeah. and his vision maybe shortly. Yeah. Uh, I think in uh, Illumina Systems, uh, uh, what I uh, observed the last uh, years, it's a very creative <laughs> company. And uh, yeah. I always have a surprise when I uh, have a visit and get some more. We as well. Hmm? No, no. So uh, um, talking from production side means that, yeah. <coughs> well, uh, the additive manufacturing means for us that we have to in the future and visions, we have to combine techniques uh, with uh, additive manufacturing. So that means, for example, so the, for example, right now we follow the bonding. So we have the glazing process, and the, we have also uh, later on you have to bring some metal parts onto it. So that means that you have uh, metallization and galvanic processes and stuff like that. And Maybe future things could be that uh, also um, uh, electric circuits can be implemented into such parts to uh, <coughs> to in or to to uh, solve problems of electrical charging, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to finalize or to close uh, the session. Uh, uh, don't hesitate to uh, visit these experts in uh, Hall uh, 11 first level, because uh, even if you are not a specialist in ceramics, you get back up uh, when it, uh, in our group of ceramic application, when you need to know something about powder, when you need to know something about uh, additive manufacturing technology, uh, people like Holger have worked a lot on uh, the post processes, but thermal technology to get it optimized uh, uh, because mainly the uh, challenge was to get the same high density of the products, yeah, because a lot of properties depend on uh, density of our uh, materials. So I hope we uh, gave you an insight that. Uh, Ceramics, it's uh, not only the tile uh, we had from space to biomedical to uh, uh, semiconductor industry a lot. And as a last, very last slide, I hope I, I have something very different. It was done at Fraunhofer uh, in Dresden and they worked with the uh, uh, mu famous museums of Dresden. And the last sentence is for Tassilo to explain uh, what an elephant made from porcelain uh, has to do with additive manufacturing. In this uh, historical ways, the trunk of this elephant got lost 200 years ago and uh, there was no uh, mold for uh, replacing this trunk. And we were asked to do this by additive manufacturing and we used again that photopolymerization. We made a porcelain slurry made of mice and porcelain <laughs> and produced uh, this trunk uh, by the uh, original 
part, which can be seen here on the right-hand side, and it could be really replaced by the um, uh, Staatliche Porzellansammlung uh. Dresden, and uh. now it can be seen there in the museum. Yeah, so uh, ceramics from the museum to space, that was maybe in a nutshell what we wanted to discuss. And thank you for listening to us, and we hope to see you a little bit later. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen, and uh, her guests. Uh, very excellent insight into ceramics. Uh, this shows again what kind of variety of topics we strive here at our AIM for You stage. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for the interest in discussion. We will head over to some more expert insights on applications from the industry. But before we do that, we get another highlight block for you. So stay tuned. We'll see you in a couple of minutes.